What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hatness, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Emily Hinks, and we speak about company culture and what it actually means and what holds it together beyond the big values that are printed on the wall and how we can actually facilitate that and what is the value of facilitation as a capacity within an organization and facilitators who come from the outside to help organizations to really live their values and be human-centered in their way of working. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes, scroll down to the show notes to download my free one-page summary. Now, lean back and be ready to be inspired. Hello, Emily. Hello. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here. It's such a pleasure. <laughs> me too. Me too. I've been following your work, heard about the great work that you and the Mischief Makers are doing. And... Cannot wait to geek out on facilitation and human connections at work. Such an important topic. Mm. It sounds fluffy and I'm looking, or sounds fluffy for many. I'm looking forward to just peel the onion with you. Yeah. Go it. I get to that. Fluffy yeah. is good as well. Fluffy and then some. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Only fluffy, maybe not. Yeah. And before we get there, I always start with the same question. When did you start calling yourself a facilitator, assuming that you do? I do. I do. Yes. I had a background in theater. Uh, so I grew up doing like um, uh, collective theater, like a lot of chorus work. Basically, I was in a lot of like workshop type rooms from a really young age into my, into my like mid 20s, I would say, where we're doing things like check ins and games and exercises and exploring like understanding humans. And I, found my way into I kind of fell into doing a master's at Hyper Island mm -hmm. I got a scholarship there and that brought me in and it was yeah an incredible uh, experience and literally on the first day when we were all stood around checking in in a circle I was like wait a minute this is familiar <laughs> I was like I know this I didn't know that you did this in because Hyper Island for anybody uh, who isn't familiar with it is like a creative business school really based around experience-based learning and there are facilitators program leaders who run the program and the work that we did there they would get a client and they would get an industry expert and we would work in groups learning things like design thinking or ux ux design and i just love i was like that's what i want to do i i didn't know that i could use all these skills that you i've just the uh, picked up along the way through theater that I can use them in business and in creative business. That's the job I want to do. And that's when I kind of came into contact with facilitation. And I straight away was like, I'm going to do facilitation. But I went into advertising and was kind of using those skills, those workshop skills to run things like idea generation or co-creation with users or with, uh, with the clients. And from then I was like, this is facilitation. And a lot of times when I told people I was a facilitator, that had no connection to that world, they would be like, you're in facilities management. <laughs> I can relate to that head that a bit. Right? <laughs> so I feel like a lot of the time when I was calling myself facilitator from then, right at the start of my career, a lot of people didn't understand it. And a lot of people said, don't call yourself a facilitator because people don't know what it is. And it's not a job that is hired for specifically yet. And say you're something else and you can facilitate And I was, I really was like, no, I think this is going to be a really big thing in the mm. future. And now, lo and behold, facilitation is everywhere, much to my delight. <laughs> Beautiful. And it's, it's so funny. I can relate to the misunderstanding, misconception of what a facilitator is. And for me, this was the reason why I started the podcast back then, because I was just tired and explaining what I do and that I'm not a coach and not a consultant mm. and not a facility manager. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it really I mean mischief has been going for seven years now and I would say it wasn't until year four or five that people were like comfortable with or familiar with the idea of like a facilitation I mean back we've evolved now but by then we were really a facilitation agency mm -hmm. and we had to explain it almost every time but I think yeah about four or five years ago it started like the term of being a facilitator or the use or application of facilitation came more into the mainstream mm -hmm. uh, so that doesn't happen so much anymore. But right back then, it, you had to be ready to defend it a lot. Yeah. 
Was this during the pandemic or even before? What you mean, the, the rise the, of... The rest? shift that people understood what facilitation was and how important it is? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I think it was starting a bit before the pandemic, for sure, because also business for us was uh, already picking up and really like uh, before the pandemic. But I think the pandemic and everyone going remote because, okay, an easy application of facilitation inside a business setting is facilitating our meetings or the workshops that we have in the business better to a high degree or to a higher level than just whoever is called the meeting is hosting it, for example. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, yeah, so that example, that was already starting to pick up and be interesting for organizations, but the lockdown and working remote, like, made a boom and sped it up because it went from, like, a nice-to-have, interesting, ish, like, need that forward thinkers had to a everybody is feeling this day-to-day -day because we cannot sit through more painful Zooms, like, the whole way through without it being yeah, facilitated and our energy levels or our focus or how we're interacting being taken into account. So it went from being a nice to have to like an absolute need to have, which accelerated it. But I do think it was starting to happen a little bit already. Beautiful. And what great intuition you had back yeah. then. <laughs> yeah. So what observation got you to start an agency and to think, okay, this is what the business world really needs? So as I said, well, I studied at Hyper Island. That's where I came in. I did my master program there. That's where I came into interaction with it. And I loved, I, I said to the program leader at the time, like, I want to do this. This is what I want to do. And he's like, mm -hmm. great, you could do it, but you need to go out into the world of work before you start consulting or facilitating for people in the world of work, which was absolute sage advice. Very well said. So I did and went into advertising. And as I said, I started, yeah, facilitating within my roles as an, an idea agent. I was called as a creative and as a strategist. To avoid the word facilitator. I yeah, exactly. Exactly. What What's billable? <laughs> Undercover facilitator. Yeah. Um, so I facilitated for different communities like She Says or Creative Mornings. Oh, my ADHD brain has taken me off track. What was the original question here? <laughs> no problem. What observation got you to the decision to start an agency? Yes, great. So I, after working a little bit in advertising, Hyper Island gave me the call up, which was great. So I started working for Hyper Island first as a consultant in London, facilitating activities for organizations. And then that's what brought me over here to Amsterdam. Actually, they asked me to launch a uh, hyper island program in the Netherlands. So introduced hyper island to the Netherlands. And that was such an incredible, like I was only 25 when I did that. Like it was a really steep learning curve, building a program for young people to break into the startup and tech uh, world, like uh, kind of transfer their skills from other studies. And I loved that, but it was such a steep learning curve that after doing it for about a year and a half, I was like still really hungry for more challenge. I got really familiar with running that program. So then I stepped into Startup Bootcamp and Inner Leaps, which was hyper-focused more on kind of like the human aspect of innovation or like a collaboration, communication, really kind of how do we reflect? How do we feedback? How do we work together? And at Hyper at, at Startup Bootcamp and Inner Leaps, it was much more focused on the kind of commercial innovation for business uh, type of facilitation. So, you know, lean startup and scale and growth. And I learned so much in both and loved applying that skill of facilitation in each context. Mm -hmm. What I really recognized was that for Hyper Island, I was, I was really lucky enough to get a scholarship there. But in general, it's very expensive to take a program like Hyper Island. Even if you get a scholarship, you know, you need to pay to study for a, a, a year, live uh, for a year. So it's quite privileged that people get to go to Hyper Island and have that experience and learn about facilitation and those techniques. And then with Inner Leaps and Startup Bootcamp, the clients were these massive companies that could do internal innovation accelerator programs and, you know, had all the budgets to spend. But what I experienced is working with the people in each of those contexts were it's so it was a bit, I don't want to say life changing, but maybe I do. It was really like mind blowing to be like, whoa, using these techniques, mm -hmm. like collaborating in this way makes us so much more effective and productive. It feels better doing this work. We're getting better results. This really is a game changer. And I really felt like if. I guess a bit, I was like, it's unfair that facilitation and these methods and techniques only exist in these quite privileged places. That's where people have access to it. So I really thought like facilitation 
should be out there in the world. What if every organization or community or place where people were coming together had the ability to do communicate more effectively, collaborate more smoothly, be more inclusive? I mean, that existed at all over the world from education to politics to, you know, as companies big and small, how much better would the world be? Mm. So this concept of facilitation as a fuel for good really mm. got into my soul, I would say. And I and I recognize that my Hyper Island programs and uh, in, a, in a Leaps were performing really well. They were selling really well. The, response, the MPSs were really high. So I was like, if I'm being paid to do this and make that money and success for other companies, I can go and do it for myself, I suspect. And it allows me to make sure that we are bringing it to, yeah, to democratize uh, facilitation and bring it out to the wider world. That was the kind of the goal. Beautiful. Beautiful. And it's somehow I assumed that you observed something in organization of what was going wrong. And uh, I really like this drive through passion and the democratization, as you said. Yeah. And I, I guess it kind of came that maybe from an, I am a relatively intuitive person. So maybe I was like, yeah, of course that's the case. But it it, it really, as I said, I definitely noticed that just bringing in that competency of facilitation yourself or empowering them people in the team to do it really filled a gap and a and a pain point that a lot of people were yeah okay if that not every personality is heard like there's a lot of times where okay we need to brainstorm and it'd be someone stood at the front and be like okay brainstorm tell me ideas you know stood at the, and like so many people wouldn't be heard and it would be the first few ideas that the loudest person threw out into the room that would be taken forward the work and the results suffer for it. People aren't as engaged and aren't as happy. So I saw that and was like, yeah, of course, because you're not being inclusive. You're not being participatory. You're not being, same with education, one-way sending, like that doesn't work. If you do an interactive experience-based learning, you can feel and see the impact it has. So yeah. it felt a bit kind of like obvious uh, to me, but validated when I was there and seeing it in action. Yeah, and I I love the, the examples you give because Yes, everyone knows these, or I think most knows these situation, like, oh yeah, let's brainstorm, give me some ideas. And I think for the person, it seems, okay, natural, okay, brainstorming, that's what we do. And once they see that it can be done differently and what it does to the room and engagement and inclusivity, you cannot unsee it anymore. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So the big impact of a just a small training unit without even scratching the surface or doing anything about facilitation. Totally. And I would say that that is how my career in mischief and facilitators I work with, how it's really grown. Indeed, that once there's a taste through it, like they'll do something themselves or the way that it's always been done. They'll bring in a facilitator and they're like, oh, that's how it can be. And that's been part of our the way that we enter into discussions about proposing work or starting to work with uh, organizations is really participatory and facilitated already. So they mm -hmm. expect it from the start because you need to have that like um felt experience of the value facilitation can bring it's yeah. near impossible to just explain why facilitation is good i mean maybe we're trying to here but it's it's so much more impactful when they it has been felt yeah yeah it's all about the experience right mm -hmm. and i think that's a big difference also to to training our consultancy that it's mm -hmm. not only about the content Yes. But absolutely. it's how the content also connects to the people and how the facilitator connects the people with each other. Wholeheartedly, yeah. <laughs> and in our exploration conversation, you spoke about the human-centered part, the human connection part of your work and how important that is. So how does this part flow into your work mm. and why does it And what's the impact on the organizations? Yes, good one. So I think that company culture, that phrase, or just this like has a bit of a bad rep. It's mm. become like a bit of a catch-all. Like we spoke about it the other day, you know, with a company that's talking about organizational readiness and culture. And it feels a little bit like a shove draw in the company. You know what I mean? When I say shove draw, you know, there's that drawer in your house where you're like, I don't know where to put this. So we'll put it in this random drawer. <laughs> and like, yeah. It's processes. It's structure. It's how we talk to one another. It's how we do feedback. It's how we, you know, nobody looks at it ever. Yeah, exactly. You just put it there and hope that it's doing all right. And like, and you can, you'll know where to find it when you need it. But uh, it's a bit of this catch all. And also I think 
when we had like, you know, Silicon Valley times of like, you know, the heyday of Google and, you know, like it's those really cool offices with slides or it's pool tables or it's the open bar Friday drinks or, you know, it's all of these things come spring maybe to like mind when we talk about like this, yeah, idea of company culture. And of course, that's like a uh, not the case. Like, you know, company culture is really, we talk about it being kind of like a garden. So a garden is always growing, it exists, and it can either grow wild, and sometimes a wild garden is lovely, but you, there's probably going to be weeds there, and there's things overgrowing, and there's stuff in the random place, and it gets kind of, it, once it's grown too far, you kind of have to wade through, you know, it's overgrown. Or you can tend to it, you can be intentional about it, and you can plant things in the right place, you can help them grow to their full potential, you can get the fruits and the flowers from it. And that's the way that we really look at company culture. Like it's going to it's gonna be there and appear mm. anyway. So let's help it serve you and serve the people. And it's interesting that it is underestimated or underrecognized sometimes like investing in company culture or how that exists. Because there's one thing, like the world of work is evolving so fast and, you know, everything's changing. We can all agree with that or has been changing these past few years. But the one thing that for sure isn't going anywhere is people coming together to get things done mm. at work. And company culture is literally just the bits in between all of that. Like it's the bits between those people. That's your company culture. And I think it is underestimated because it isn't as tang- tangible. It is qualitative. It's, I mean, there are great stats that show it quantitatively that have been done, but it's kind of felt, right? So it's harder to tie down and be like, uh, the you know, there's not results and targets connected to it very easily. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, sorry. No, no, go, go, tell me. I was just thinking, you mentioning this, um, the Silicon Valley culture and the Friday drinks. And when I hear you speaking, company culture is what happens on Monday morning after the drinks or when to meet while nobody is looking? How do you meet each other in the elevator? So the small moments that are not recorded, that don't yes. get into the statistics, I think. Yeah. Right? And it's how your people are feeling on a Sunday evening. Like if it's, you're like, oh, I don't want to go in on Monday. Like that's that's where you, what your company culture is impacting. Mm-hmm. And It's also how you're coming together in your meetings. Like we know it from our social life as well. Like, and it's literally on a brain, on a chemical level. Like where our court, if our cortisol is high, then we're less effective when we're communicating. If we're not effective when we're communicating, we're not collaborating well, we're not collaborating well. We're not producing great results. And that's what you're supposed to be doing in, in a business. Yeah. So I feel like, and there's all that kind of money that's lost, for example, like that is a tangible thing. I think it's like, I, I even wrote it down earlier. So I had it, but it was uh Yeah, 37 billion each year is spent in the US on unproductive meetings. 37 billion. Like that's that's only a, in like, the US. Yeah, I mean in the US, but I guess it's comparable. Only, yeah, only in the US. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's the, the it, there are tangible parts like that that you can say come this is these are the parts of company culture is where it's impacting the bottom line. And it is company culture, how people relate with one another, how people feel when they're together, how that's enabling them to communicate that you are will save you money and productivity and um retention of your people um, and quality of the work or not if you don't think about uh, how you're fostering an environment where people feel safe where people feel able to show up as their uh, best selves yeah. um, and there's one other th- one other tiny thing while I'm in the stats part thinking about it that connected to earlier you said okay the difference that COVID made and it There was a bit of this kind of idea that actually like being remote and post-COVID made us more productive. But actually the stats are saying that since COVID, like now, uh, there's an 18% of an increase of work that's been happening outside of business hours. There's a 20% average increase of the hours that we work in a day. And there is a 20% decrease in productivity. Mm -hmm. Like And those are things that your culture and your ways of working that they influence. So it really is so important that it's got to be on the mind of leaders in business because it is affecting the bottom line. The culture is directly connected to that and it's so underestimated. Yeah. yeah and what really resonates with me, what you're just saying, is that culture boils down to communication, the way how we communicate Because that's at the beginning of the collaboration, everything that happens after. And the statistics about the 
meetings reminds me of, I think it was Joe Allen who said that the outcome of a bad meeting are more meetings. Yes. <laughs> and for me, what I made out of it is have the meeting before the meeting instead of afterwards. So meet the people beforehand to prepare it well to foster relationships and then the meeting will be faster and in the future you don't need the pre-meetings anymore but definitely don't do the post meetings no exactly and that's the thing as well like uh it's a really we talk like talk about sometimes we do facilitation training inside organizations so, because we'll start working with them and they'll see what we're doing the value that it's bringing to how they're showing up and getting work done they were like we want to be able to do this in our day-to-day -day, in our meetings And it's really a small but mighty shift when people just know how to host meetings more effectively. And it is something that's just one of those things that you're kind of supposed to know how to do to like you're socially expected to have picked that up through just being in a work environment. But what if you've been picking up bad habits from people? Um, what if you aren't an expert communicator? You're very good at your job, your skill set that you're supposed to be doing, but not great at hosting meetings. So just bringing in that capability of facilitation, of facilitative leadership and thinking about, okay, we've got an hour together. How do we best use that hour to stop it? Like, oh my gosh, the, we'll circle back after the meeting. Like, <laughs> no, just like it. I mean, you can, but there's, you could get so much more out of your meeting time with the skill of facilitation and with stronger relationships amongst your uh, yeah. employees. What do you think is the biggest misconception about corporate meetings that managers hold? I think it is potentially the proportioning of speaking time. Mm. So I think there's something of like a meeting host is the person who's speaking through. It's it's a little bit like a herald back to like the school times as well. I'm a teacher at the front and I'm going to send the information at you. You're going to listen. You're going to capture. You're going to go away. Remember and do it like but actually meetings. You should only be meeting to do live in person to do the things that you can't can only do when you're together. And it's such a waste if that just means there's one person predominantly speaking, because if it is that they really need to share something back, maybe, maybe part of that, or sometimes that's important to do in person, but that could be a Loom video, that could be explained somewhere, it could be, you know, like, so that the time, that valuable time that you have there together should be in discussion, should mm -hmm. be people giving input or giving instruction. Does that make sense? No, how about doing it? You know, it should be working and figuring things out together. I, I, there's so many meetings, like I'm sure if we had like an audience and asked for a raise of hands, like how many times you're in a meeting where you're just like, why I'm in this meeting or that you don't open your mouth once, mm -hmm. in which you could have just watched a recording of that meeting. Yeah, yeah. And I wonder whether there is an illusion of control. Oh, if everyone is sitting there, then they're absorbing the information. Where in reality, how do you know? Most of the time they're doing something else because it's just this avalanche of information. Yeah, especially like I think through Zoom, that was one of the things that really made or through working remote that made this was the uptick in, okay, we need to get this right. We need to think about how we're having meetings about how our, our company culture is working because we don't want people to just be writing emails or Googling or have their camera off when they're in the meeting. So there's this idea that happens kind of then that people were doing other things at the same time, rather than being present in the meeting. When we were in the office together, we could see that everybody was there. But I think it's a bit of a misconception that okay, physically everybody was there when we were in the office, but were meetings really better? Was everyone present and paying attention and inputting and interacting? Or were people daydreaming or checking their phone or being passive? So I think it has been a problem historically and it was a bit kind of in front of us more a bit now that we've moved remote, but it should be, it should be worth someone's time. They should have left and got something like it's, it's, A meeting host's job, it's a company's job, it's a our organization's job to make meetings useful. Otherwise, let the people go and get on with their work, like or yeah. do the other thing. That other thing was obviously more important if you've not kept their in intention and engagement. Yeah. And it's yeah, the two resources that we when we waste them, we don't get them back, which is attention and time. Uh, we do need to respect them by yeah, engaging the people who are showing up in a meeting. And, and one more thing comes to my mind that there was um, research showing that also, even in social moments where the person who speaks the most considers the conversation as the most enjoyable, 
Uh-huh. So the more you speak, the more enjoyable you find a conversation. Interesting. And the same applies to meetings. Mm. So the manager, if the manager is the one who speaks the most and then thinks, oh, that was a really good meeting, mm. um, and then doesn't ask for feedback or there's no such company culture or a speak up culture where mm. someone would say, you know what, this meeting actually doesn't really work for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then they will just continue in the illusion. Oh, yeah, we have great meetings. Mm. Yeah, that really resonates. That that makes total sense. And I think it's something like um, that's the, the interesting part between, I guess, this facilitation as a job and a core practice and skill that can be applied like uh, to, you know, training programs, experiences, retreats, offsites. And then I get, think there's day to day facilitation, which is a competency within a role. And I think in that angle of facilitation as like um a competency oh my gosh my adhd brain has lost the thought again uh but managers who speak a lot yeah exactly i think that there's that day to day oh yeah that's what i was going to say so that facilitation as a profession we know it's connection first and then content so mm-hmm. as soon as room as quickly as we can we do something like a check-in to make sure that everybody's voice has been in the room at least once because once your voice is in the room once it's more likely to be there again and people get the memo that it's like oh this is a time that I'm expected to speak and be here and it kind of sets that standard and I think that's a really small hack from like professional facilitation on a larger scale that uh, managers and leaders can bring into their skill set into their facilitation capability of their of their job to in meetings make sure that you're hearing from your team as early as you can that it's not just been you for whatever period of time because it sets that standard it gets people used to it and it's such a small hack but it even the little things like that really go a long way even if you're not using conversation formats or even if you're not using uh like a a warm-up or a hot start activity to get people in the mindset you need or whatever else yeah i love that and it reminds me of When you're going to a very nice restaurant and that you experience at once how really, really good food can taste, Mm -hmm. then maybe you will not be able to replicate this at home. But maybe you pick up that, oh, if I just use a better olive oil, yeah, already makes a difference. Or Or butter. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Right. So if you can just pick up a few small things and then, but it also you value the craft more. And I have the impression with facilitation, once you have tasted it, how it could be, you see what's not working daily and you appreciate the the capacity of facilitation more. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the same is true in general for investing in company culture for, mm-hmm. for businesses. So the same, yeah, exactly the same uh, idea concept can be applied to yes okay individuals picking up those facilitation skills that's going to strengthen for sure leaders but I think everybody's uh, functioning within a performance within an organization but on a business level organization level getting a taste of we took we call it like the ROI like the return on investment of human connection Mm -hmm. Um, so organizations that invest in thinking about the company culture that organization design once they start to do it a little bit and I think it feels counterintuitive at first because it's like, oh, we're going to take everyone off to a team day or an offsite, or we're going to start doing meetings that are just about practicing how we're bringing our values to life or whatever. It feels like a cost. We're taking people away from their billable hours or from the work that they're doing. And that's painful. Like it's hard to do. But the return on that when, the, you know, when they experience that boosted sense of belonging means that there is more psychological safety. So people are speaking up more and challenging one another more. The silos are broken between our departments. So things that were getting work that was getting repeated or things that were getting lost between the cracks of nearly disappeared. There's more movement of talent through the organization. We're keeping people, you know, there's all of those things are started to be felt once they've done a, that's why a work often evolves that will do an offsite or a leadership retreat or a team day or something with an organization the return on that the experience and the impact that that's have is felt in the next mm-hmm. uh, coming months and then it becomes okay we're definitely bringing you back from next time and we start that conversation of and we spoke about this uh before we were talking together Miriam the idea that 
if you're just doing company offsites or team days, which are, that's a great start, that's better than not doing them. And it's better than doing them where they're just like, okay, we're going to a bar and we're putting money behind it and maybe we'll go quad biking, biking, you know, thinking a bit more intentionally about how you spend those days is already a step in the great, like great step in a good direction. But we can view them a little bit like um, if you go to a yoga retreat or like a training boot camp for one weekend, you're not then like, great, I'm going to be relaxed and flexible for the rest of the year. Or this is, my, <laughs> yeah, this is my fitness for the rest of the year. You know, there needs to be either there's a training plan that you're keeping up self-directed or you're returning to like booster sessions or classes, or you get, if you're really like, you want to go deep in it, then you're getting a personal trainer who's working in coaching and guiding you through that. And that's kind of the work that how it evolves. They feel the impact of having been intentional about how they bring people together, how they build up their uh, sense of belonging, how they bring their values into their day-to-day practice, how they communicate cross-culturally or whatever it is. And then they say, how do we keep this alive? How do we not make it a moment in time? And how do we invest in this and then feel the return? Yeah. I love the example with the yoga because it makes it so tangible and so clear. And what also crossed my mind is any relationship, any personal relationship or romantic relationship requires so much work yeah. every day, intentional communication, coming together, being open, being transparent, all of that. And still it's difficult. Now, yeah. when we think of some of the professional relationships, our coworkers, people spending almost more time with their coworkers than with their spouse. Yeah. And this connection also needs to be shaped and transformed, need to have the language um, and to, to go through the motions. And I think that's something that is very difficult to learn personally mm -hmm. because we don't see it until it blows. Either it's perfect or it blows up, but everything, yeah. the work in between. And then to be intentional about it and say, okay, this is what makes company culture and we need to foster, take care, train that. I think it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, really. And I just, as I said, that it came up, like there's something we also talk about when we're talking about things like feedback or taking time to reflect and learn together or yeah, that we talk about that being a vitamin instead of a paracetamol. So mm. taking a bit of it regular or like, you know, living a healthy lifestyle so that you don't get sick rather than oh there's a real like tension and uh that's happened within this team is about to combust because they haven't given each other feedback or they've had these difficulties going on that haven't been addressed they've been stuck in an in a, a lower performing team dynamic uh stage and now it's hit danger point so we're going to do something about it and that's a paracetamol you know that's a painkiller that can help still you can take the pain away and you can give them a healthy plan to go forward after that but better yet that we take that vitamin that we do those healthy practices beforehand so it doesn't get to that crunch point and i think like in like 2024 like like globally we've all got a better perspective i think on self-care we're starting to recognize like how important self-care is, you know, there's like burnout, there's like, uh, like just looking at health. We're all so much more educated and aware of like, yeah, okay. Self-care really matters. Mental health matters. We're caring for ourselves. I think that's starting to bleed into, oh yeah, it, it does make sense that we would take care of one another and our colleagues mm -hmm. so that the workplace is a nicer, better, healthier place to be. And to your point that you said earlier about how much time you spend with your colleagues, there's like an amazing graph that I love. If the show notes, I'll uh, send it to you put, to put it there. And it shows in a lifetime how much time we spend with our parents or our family or our friends or our partners, and then how much time we spend with our coworkers. And it's so striking. You can imagine, you're like, oh my gosh, coworkers is like this big chunk in the middle and it's so much compared to these other graphs. So prime real estate of our lifetime, of mm. our time that we spend in this world, like the time we spend in a day, it doesn't have to be difficult and painful and draining and stressful. Like how much better if that is engaging, enjoyable, cup filling time, like that's not to say that it's not going to be hard work. And yes, we're being paid to show up, but it doesn't have to be this or that. We can be being paid to show up. We can do a good job. It can be hard work, but it can also be positive nice human time as well <laughs> totally and 
One thing that I wonder when I think of human connection, there is, I wonder to what extent it is possible to create that between any human. Mm. Because there are some, maybe we don't want to connect. Maybe we don't agree with them. We have maybe difficulties clashing personalities. So you have all of that and you didn't choose your co-workers as you might hopefully choose your your mm. partners and friends. How do you go about that? And what are maybe the pushbacks from the organizations that you get if you speak about human connection? Mm. That's a really good truth that yes, we do. I mean, but we also don't choose our families, but we have to spend time with that you know there's there are times where it can mm. be tense but you know you do like uh or in laws or whatever it is yeah. but there's a necessity maybe in families it's different but for sure in organizations that is true that you don't pick those co-workers but you but the, the truth is you have to function together with them you mm-hmm. need to whether you get on or not and no one's saying you have to be best friends with everybody although there's a stat let me try and remember it as something like people are seven times more engaged in their work if they have a work bestie Mm-hmm. Um, because they I, continue to work uh, to speak about work after work yeah so yeah much. probably yeah exactly and they're just again that there's so many like we see it day to day with mischief makers and there are loads of stats to support it and studies that positivity and enjoyment and engagement really boost the quality of work and so yes they don't have not everybody has to be best friends but they have to function together so that that's the lowest bar to be able mm-hmm. to show up and communicate and function together and it should be absolutely imperative that we want to make sure that our teams can function together and that needs to be a certain level of respect and understanding so we don't have to be besties or love or like uh, want to spend all of our time together but that isn't even there in a lot of cases even if it's kind of performing in that way like um under the surface, they're like, uh, like I'm raging at this person, this passive aggression, you're less likely to support them, or you might be slower to engage, you know, so there's just such value and benefit to it when so if, if organizations were like, we don't need people to get on, there's the one, okay, but you need them to function. And there's the two, if they did get on, like there's um, a study where people go into a room with a stranger uh, that they don't know and their brain recognizes them as a stranger and their cortisol peaks that makes them less able to communicate as effectively there's a kind of hesitancy and uh yeah you wouldn't take risks you wouldn't challenge one another and again that means band work and then they play guitar hero i think for five minutes together and already after five minutes your brain chemical you register that person as a friend which means you get the happy chemicals that are connecting your cortisol is way down you're able and willing to collaborate and communicate more effectively with this person yeah it so is, that isn't yeah. just one sake basically yeah and the the effort that we are very often and think unconsciously making to avoid situations that feel painful or dangerous. So for instance, asking someone we don't like for help. Mm. And I said, I think there's a book about that, how easy we then distract ourselves and create more work mm. just for our brain to make sense, ah. to defend the situation. Okay, this is dangerous. Let me focus on that. Yeah. And then unconsciously we start producing totally unnecessary work. Yeah. Yeah. And I was fascinated when I heard about that because I can see it even in myself all the time. What do I do to avoid doing unhappy work? And I think that's another good argument why the human connection is so important. Yeah. And also it's building this. Okay. I feel like I keep (laughs) referring to studies, but there was a really funny one that basically said that there was a correlation between divorce rate and couples that owned a dishwasher or didn't own a dishwasher. Because <laughs> I am not surprised. See, yeah, exactly. Right. Because of the negotiation that you have to do around who's going to wash the dishes, the little fights that you have and stuff like that, that, that mean that when the big fights come up, you've got a bit of background of like how we fight, how we negotiate, how we navigate this together. And similarly, like things happen within business. You might lose a big client. There's a really difficult issue you're working with as a current and if you've already built some of that relationship between the people in the team it means you're like you're more resilient you're set up for when change or difficult things happen and you're in it together versus being alone I'm looking out for myself and it means that people can give if you have a, a formed relationship with somebody and those positive connections with them 
you're more likely to be invested in nurturing that relationship and giving feedback or, you know, and then when you do come to those parts, it's easier to access, whereas you're just going to play it safe. Otherwise, you're not going to risk your own sanity or your own uh, well-being. Yeah. Um, and what comes up for me is um, then the balance. And you spoke about, yes, the connection and the psychological safety and the feedback. And for me, then the the genuine candid conversation or the feedback or even the boundary setting becomes even more important when we have a good connection. Yeah. Because then we don't want to get everyone into burnout because they're so invested and in, that they cannot say no. And yes. I think it was a previous podcast guest who spoke about the problem in organizations that um, people don't learn to set boundaries, which then yeah. leads to burnout. Yeah. And I think this actually needs to go hand in hand. Yes, let's foster connection yeah. and create the culture where actually well-being, self-care and boundaries yes. are important. And support. Absolutely. And this is a really interesting aspect of like, it's not just, so it used to be that companies could rely a little bit on the, okay, the vibes in the office or, you know, doing like, yeah, we're going to go to a cookery class together or whatever and building. And that does build the relationships, but true that in isolation, I mean, it does build the relationships to a degree. I think it can be much better done by intentional designed uh, offsites and activities, but that without the organizational design and the culture design around that can lead to this for sure, which is why it's so powerful that when organizations do articulate things like their, it can be things like values, but I almost get nervous when a company's like, but we've got our values because it's often just like big words or statements that are, we call about on, say it's on the walls and not in the halls. And so the work that we do with organizations is really like, really, how do we bring, it's called applied culture. So it's how do we take those ideas, those guiding principles of how you work together in this organization and what your culture, like the, the articulation of your culture, what does that mean on a day-to-day -day level for these departments, for these teams, for these individuals? How do I put it into practice? How do I know if I'm living up to it? Can I hold myself and others accountable to it? What are the rituals and habits that take place around that? And you can do things like a scenario game. So in this scenario, if our value is really about being candid or radical candor, for example, how does that play out in this scenario? You know, like really getting it into practice rather than just like a nice to have words on a wall, because that's the difference between, I mean, there's that whole theory, which I agree with that a company isn't a family. This isn't your family. Like you are paid to work here. There are agreements. People need to perform. We are colleagues. We're not like we can become friends, but we are also colleagues there's a role that we you know we need to negotiate or we need to manage and that infrastructure of processes team rituals and values allow us to navigate and uh, and say actually this doesn't feel in line with our value or our process mm -hmm. this so we can hold boundaries for ourselves but also hold each other accountable to them so that the work is still at the heart of everything yeah yeah and it feels almost as if many organizations have the values because it's written in a book that as a company yeah. you need to have values and then they forget that there's actually a good reason for them to have the values and the benefit of faster decision making because everyone in the company understands okay these are our values if i have option a or option b i look at the values it can only be option a so these kind of things and i think they yeah they often forget that how important it can be if they're lived and communicated and just make everything a little bit smoother. Yeah, exactly. And it's expecting that we should just know, like, you know, because they're, they're, they're like, they're, I think that's a big thing that's happened since lockdown. Managers now have these decentralized teams often. And already there's a bit of a problem that managers are often not always, but often people who have been really great at that job and that role and have been high performers. And then therefore it's like, great, you're going to get a, what do you call it? A raise, a promotion. Promotion. I was going to say evolution. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. You get a, a promotion and now you've got a team that's working under you and it's just kind of like expected that maybe you've been managed before so you know how to manage sometimes there's a management training often there isn't and they're just expected to know how to do that and then bring in the extra perspective of 
maybe this is remote, maybe this is decentralized. You're not sat next to people having conversations with them throughout the day all day. You're not building those relationships kind of by accident around this. I mean, I don't know who is spending so much time around the water cooler, you know, this like uh, water cooler moments, but there are those micro social moments that used to take place in the office. And if we are remote or flexi working, and we're therefore not having those human moments with people that kind of happened accidentally before, but then you need to manage them. And there, there aren't places that are dedicated to helping you form relationships and build that human connection with these people. And then there aren't guidelines that hold us accountable to how we're supposed to show up and perform together that we can lean on or utilize. Then how are people supposed to know? Then it's just luck of the draw if you've got a manager who intuitively somehow through osmosis has got it. Like, <laughs> Yes, and it's such an important... I'm thinking of the different personality types. There are those who are just like, oh, I do whatever. And if it's against the rule, someone will tell me. And as long as nobody tells me, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. So I just do my job. And for them, it's okay. They most likely perform even better without having these very strict processes or guidance from a. And on the other hand, there are those who do need a little bit more certainty, boundaries, processes mm -hmm. to understand, am I on track? Am I allowed to do that? And for them, it can create a huge amount of anxiety mm. um, and uncertainty and really hinder their productivity if they don't have that. Yeah, exactly. And I think that the people who are the first example that you gave that I can kind of like wing it and see and like, then they often can get on with it and are higher performing. But this scenario supports them as well so that they can be doing that But that, it's this like overprepared, understructured, again, yeah. just like, a, you know, a mantra of facilitators that applies to company culture as well, that it's like, it's great that it's there. And we know, like, through those activities, the applied culture work that we do with organizations, not just the offsites and teams, A's, but all the touch points in between, make it usable and understandable. And then those people that are kind of like they can wing it and they uh, can go with it, they can pull from that and adopt the bits that work for them. It's It should never be like a rigid, like, this is what's to be done. Yes. But it is this, like, place that you can pull from and under understand and interact with. God um, ways. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like, sometimes for the garden analogy, again, it is nice to let a, a plant grow. Mm -hmm. And they take over and then what? And you're like, wow, it looks beautiful that way. But some need a little bit more like care and attention. Otherwise they're going to die or like the, you know, they won't fruit or they won't flower that year. So it's definitely not a one size fits all, but it, that's why it takes attention to, which is why I guess you bring in organizations like mm -hmm. us. It takes attention to the signs that you should be looking out for and the techniques that really have high yield and that pay off and that fit for your environment, you know, is your garden, uh, you, is it super rainy in this environment or is it very dry or is it, yeah. What just came up, and maybe it's also, the, can the garden have different areas? Because when I think yeah. of applied culture, then who is, there's the part that are the values that can be lived and there's a formal part of the culture. And then there's, Maybe the weeds or the beautiful nature flowers, field flowers that grow, yeah. that yeah. also impact the um, the culture. And then there might be some subcultures. Yes. That. So how do you, how do you have this intentional cross organization, especially when it's a multinational? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. How do you yeah. how do you help them through the consistency? Yes, I love this question and. Um, I love that it's working with the the metaphor as well. And there's two things that come to mind with it for me. One is a lot of the work we do, we've been doing the past couple of years is with ERG groups. Mm -hmm. So ERG group is employee resource group. So it's it's groups within an organization who come together over like a shared yeah, reason. So there's women at at Gen or there's parents at Netflix or there's people of color at you know, there's, there's different uh, reasons to come to one of the ones we work with a lot with Nike is disabilities at, mm. disability at Nike um, because I'm neurodiverse and I do a lot of work around neurodiversity in the workplace that's a tangent though but um, what makes me think of it is that each of those ERGs that employee-led 
So it's people who are passionate about coming together to share perspective as what it's like to be working as this group of people inside the organization and feed that back into the org and change maybe policies or ways of working and find camaraderie. And they need enough guidance and infrastructure that they are able to thrive. And, you know, they're busy people. They've got their full time job and they're dedicating to this. So they need enough structure or guidance to let to help that time be well spent. And that's what we do. We create a strategy around like how to like come together as a committee, uh, how to use the time they spend together. But it absolutely can't be too stifling or too like um set that they mm. it doesn't grow into what it needs to be because every one of those groups will have different needs and different applications and it needs to be allowed to take the shape that it should with the people that are there and we use this analogy of they're each their own type of plant they've each mm. got the they're going to flower and show in different ways and they have absolutely different things but they all need a plot and they all need some type of sun and some type of rain mm. um, Beautiful. And the, so what I hear and understand is, A, they're doing this basically in their free work. So it's like a club or hobby, but within the organization. And so it does need this kind of freedom so that it's enjoyable for them, that they can continue to do what they do. And working with these groups is so impactful because they are, by definition, coming from different parts of the organization linked through either a passion or a characteristic or an yeah. identifier. Yeah, exactly. And they are usually enabled by the organization as well. So they have some budget, maybe a portion of their time is allocated to it. Yeah. Um, and it's a great, such a beautiful, ERGs is such a brilliant, beautiful example of like human-centered organizational design because it really means it's coming from the people. The people have a say in the orchestration and development of the organization. But to your point, that's one of the things that came up when you mentioned about the garden of can there be different parts? I think the other example is what we talk about is like localizing company culture. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we work a lot with Netflix and they have their like absolute pioneers of incredible company culture. Their culture memo has always been and they've just evolved it like an absolute like best practice example. And yeah, I've obviously worked into it a lot and spoken a lot with that. It really is. It's it's well like it's felt with and, and understood within the organization, they made it in a really powerful way. But still, having said that, it is these words on a slide or words in a memo that people receive, and maybe there's some discussion around it. And then it's like, okay, guidance, let's go. But what we do is we work with different regions or departments to say, within this context, within the work that you're doing, within marketing or within the MENA region or within, like, how do we understand? this value like how do we understand resilience what does uh, like we we unpick the word we use some exercises of sharing stories of where it's come up or where it hasn't we like um, play some scenario games around it we put on different thinking you know there's many different things we do within those sessions that we have together mm -hmm. to really make it embodied and again the feedback we're getting from people is like I theoretically knew what that word meant and I understood why it's important within this, but I didn't know how to connect that to my day to day. And also the, the subculture, like you said, the culture within the team, because there is the overarching culture and values and agreements and the way that the company culture, but there's team cultures as well, which is made is a sum of the parts of the people within it. So we often do things like a social contract exercise with those groups where it's like, informed and inspired by that company culture so it shouldn't be in contest or in conflict with the company mm -hmm. culture but what in our own words are behaviors that I can live up to and I can ask you to live up to that are present in our day-to-day -day. and that's the localizing of the because I'm English but I'm also northern English like mm -hmm. and cultures are, are different so that's beautiful so if I understand correct it's Recognizing, acknowledging that, okay, their company values and cultures, this is defined by the headquarters. And then how can we make it our own in the different entities, depending on what's working? And I, I would be very curious how this works out because Netflix is a beautiful example. It's a tech company where you have the programmers, right? The software engineers and programmers are so very tech. And you have the creatives, you have those who produce the movies, you have those who have to market the movies, and then you have 
all the admin work, like you have the finances and and how to bring all of these together so that they still feel a sense of belonging, mm. connection and the shared culture. And I would say it's also inward and outward because an organization like Netflix also works with a lot of different agencies and partners mm. to create its content, to market its content, to, and we've done uh, sessions that are together also with their partners because it, it's not just a company culture isn't just what is happening inside. Uh, I say the building, but inside the company space, you know, that can also be uh, a remote and uh, not physical, but it is also it influences the the perception of the brand and the perception of the organization. It's what also can very powerfully attract new talent and retain talent. It's what people are talking about with their friends and their family and their partners about how work has been. Like it isn't just an inwards issue or inwards factor to consider. It shows outwards as well. And I think some of the most beloved brands, and it certainly is the case for mischief makers, it's how all of our clients or people feel when they have interacted with the, with us and walk away, that's our culture. And that massively impacts our brand. And, you know, a brand is super important for any business. Yeah. Um, I would perceive, uh, yeah. And the, the stamp the, that we're leaving on the world. Uh, yeah. Especially if you have potentially so much impact. Mm -hmm. So as a, As an agency of facilitators, really stepping into these companies, shaping their cultures, helping their people to connect to each other and showing them what facilitation is, that's a huge impact. Yeah, I like to think so. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm running out of time with all the topics that I still want to um, want to address. And out of curiosity, what is... So where does the name mischief makers come from and how does the mischief show up in the, in the work that you do? So in the, yeah. Good one. <laughs> so the name mischief makers came from, it kind of loops back to the start of our conversation when we were talking about when you started calling yourself a facilitator, for sure, the types of projects or work I was doing or the expertise I was bringing, I guess, was harder to articulate. That would be like a, so when, someone was introducing me basically uh, in an email to someone, I guess, for a project or something. He was like, what do I call you? And I was like, I, I don't know. What do you, what do you want to, what do you want to call me? And he introduced me as the biggest mischief maker he knew. <laughs> and I was so like, cool. uh, I'm going to take that and put it in my pocket. Cause none of the jobs, I mean, idea, agent, creative strategist, none of these titles really fully resonated with what it felt like I was doing. And I think this idea of mischief, of doing things differently, of shaking it up, I really think the world of work and maybe the world could do with a bit more joy. And like, I think that somehow along the way, we've equated play with being less serious or therefore less credible. Uh, and and I, I do a lot of work around creativity with London Business School. Like I do a lot of perspective of like a high level business leadership capabilities needing creativity and for me that is synonymous with needing to get comfortable with the idea of being playful and explorative like we are most creative when we're children and we're young and it's no accident that that is around when we're playing a lot as well so I sometimes we've had that discussion or advice from people along the way but oh mischief like is are they gonna you know is that too playful or too much for people. But I mean, we've literally, we've worked with the UAE government, with banks, with the World Bank globally, with uh, some more kind of large or traditional organizations. And everybody is human. Everybody has family or, or friends where they like, who doesn't enjoy smiling? <laughs> you know, And it's not breaking the rules if that's in work. And I think I really stand by like actually saying like, yes, yes, mischief. Yes, a bit of play. Let, yeah, yes, enjoying yourself in the, in work. That's kind of, I guess, what mischief brings in or stands for. And I like that essence of it. There was a second part to your question after. How you bring the mischief into your work. And I ah, yeah. can already see the red <laughs> thread actually throughout our conversation. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly that. I think really giving permission to enjoy and engage and feel refueled after being together and working together rather than drained. I think 
what we're known for the most is like the like the energy that we bring. So I think it is, and that's the Moorishness. That's why our business was able to grow in the first three years, like with inbound entirely because it's that we were like oh that felt good I want more of that like I don't want why would I have the painful version when it could be uh, engaging and enjoyable and um, one of our mantras for mischief is seriously awesome results don't require serious behavior and I think that that is what we're being brought in for I felt so like uh, validated or vindicated this year when there's a, a brilliant TED talk by two Stanford professors talking about the power of humor in the workplace and like one of the highest rated like uh for leaders that perform the highest is that they like talk like a real human like they don't mm. you know above and superior and, and the they did this it's really worth watching the TED talk but the examples that they gave of like just bringing in that like humor and personal and personality yeah is really really effective as a leader and I think that that's kind of what we're known for that relationship that we have with our clients with the people that we work with um, and that's what we really try and bring in just that authentic human connection yeah. part I love it the, mm -hmm. and I can see that when this is what you stand for and your facilitators then walking in with this with the permission to be yourself yeah a little bit of a mischief maker this kind of puts a lot of weight from the shoulders in terms of I need to be professional, I need to be this, that, that, need to conform. And then all this stiffness and stress then impacts the entire group. Whereas on yeah. the opposite, when you can arrive as yourself, it's like, yeah. huh. And yeah. then everyone in the room can also go like, huh. Me too. I that can already also, feels yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, I think really that, yeah, there's the... It is contagious, the idea of like, look, we're here to, we're going to get things done. This is a room of clever, hardworking people. We're here to do it. But that indeed, that doesn't need to be stiff and hard and difficult. Like it can be hard. We can be sweating at the end, but it doesn't need to be painful. And you're walking away like, I don't want to do that again. It's funny, actually, because um, in very tough projects, We, if we have fun, yes, we work more hours and we don't burn out. We burn out, not necessarily when we work a lot, but when it's draining. Exactly, exactly. And that's such an important factor as well, because when it is really hard work, this isn't to say that we're not touching upon sometimes incredibly hard hitting issues or topics or complexities, but it's going in with a bit more grace and a bit more kind of, yeah, again, just that like... uh on a human level, on an equal, mm -hmm. on a like, uh, okay, let's be strong and supportive and together in this and tackle it and like strain through it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For you, what makes a workshop work? Uh, what makes a workshop fail? Oh, what makes a workshop fail? Um, I would have used to say, I think, um, packing when too much is packed into Uh, one session and that's definitely something I think all facilitators can be like oh sometimes we're still guilty of that because we're so enthusiastic but this really should be in there and this should so it feeling rushed or too busy or too tight and that is difficult but I think that that, oh, that can be something that makes it fail but I think that a skilled facilitator can really feel that and we talk about being over prepared and under structured indeed so in the moment taking things out or moving things around is becomes quite second nature but I think really what makes a workshop fail is if it just stays that workshop like mm. just is that moment in time where okay there might have been some like ahas or mindset shifts or bonds that are built but like there's that forgetting curve and you know things like that that if you don't repeat like come back to it a few days later then it's forgotten if you do come back to it a few days later it extends a bit more but then it's forgotten and if you do like you know a period after that then you kind of keep it forever so I think I think what makes a workshop fail is just having The perspective that it's a moment in time we talk about things not being like a firework moment you know it's like oh ah that's a beautiful firework but it fades quickly maybe we take a photo but we never look back at it mm -hmm. um instead it should be workshops or off-sites or moments like this should be a beat drop in a song like it's only made so powerful and memorable by all the things that come before it and what happens afterwards and you enjoy the song. You're not like, oh, I mean, maybe you really do love that beat drop, but you're not like, you don't turn it on just to listen to that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think- Great example. It, yeah, thanks. I think a workshop fails if it's not part of a bigger rhythm. Yeah. And what remains your facilitation challenge? Good question. I think 
a little bit of that. It's about how to make it that accessible. Like how to, because the reality is still like the, we're working within a capacity, you know, every, like people are working really hard on crazy hours and like, so like we've been developing really closely with some of our favorite clients, the way to like make that the most accessible. So how do we continue doing this work in a way that doesn't interrupt, but a way that blends in a way mm-hmm. that supports and the things that we're already doing. So I think that this has been a really interesting space for us to be like, creating solutions for and developing and scaling and rolling like that out and developing it further, I think is something that I'm super interested in. Yeah. How to facilitate the continuation Mm -hmm. in a way that really is adoptable within the full organizational design context. Interesting. So this means fitting into the workday, maybe not taking too much time, being very easily accessible, maybe even fun, maybe fostering the connection. Yeah. And I think it's like adoptable. It's like the rollout and the adaptation and the when that like, you know, like it's a mixture of coaching, of communities of practice, of yes, some sessions, but then also resources that people can refer to and guides and then how you the things that you're doing before and after the gatherings when you do come together and looking at existing structures like, okay, if there is a something that happens within this organization and this team that we have this stand up here and here, what within that can we uh, tweak or add to make this plant to over here so it's just it it really becomes more organizational design and it needs time and care and consideration so you need leaders that are buying from the top top level Mm -hmm. that are buying into this this is something that the department heads who feel it day to day who know that it needs to change can often uh, mandate so it needs to be recognized from above and because the people in the highest levels aren't feeling that day to day the piece of like, uh, yeah, bridging those gaps. And I think one of the things we've seen that's most interesting is that organizations that are scaling very fast and turning into these really established companies, they're starting to think about their culture because they're moving from 300 people to whatever number. And they've been able to get away with it a little bit so far. And now they're like, okay, we really need. So we're able to build that with them from the start. And like, oh, it's so satisfying to see how much it works. But when there are big, organizations with established practices and culture it takes more of like a political navigation to be an added trust and recognition of seeing how it could happen that you start to be able to do those things and it's really interesting work but it takes a lot of internal campaigning because this culture work and this organizational design isn't something that used to sit historically in a budget for the year Mm -hmm. like is something that has evolved and it's starting to but it's not guaranteed yet and the companies that are really going to thrive and survive and be resilient are the ones that, yeah, and adaptable are the ones that introduce this uh, and, and invest in it, I believe. Yeah, investing in their people in this. Yeah. To avoid all of that, what we mentioned before, I was just thinking of, is it James Clear with the micro habits? Mm. That, so how can you... From an organizational design perspective, how can you use these big formats, as you said, the stand-ups or the town halls or the weekly meetings? And how can you add a micro habit in that that will serve as a reminder? So, so I think um, one of his examples was what can you do right after something that you do anyway, like brushing the teeth, if you just stick a new habit right yeah. behind an existing habit. Exactly. It's more likely to stick. It's and exactly that. that. And it's less intrusive. Like it's mm-hmm. less like, oh, I have to get this whole new thing or like, yeah, it's less forgettable. It's, yeah, it's ex- exact. That's the best uh, uh, example of it for sure. And and it is really small things. Like we have a website that's called Mischief Meeting Moments and it's just mm-hmm. like a check-in question and check-out question generator. And there's some also like some exercises that you can use in meetings there. Um, just free online that people can use it and even just starting your meetings with a check-in question and it can seem again this idea of like but we're at work we need to be serious like I need to get the work done Um, but just like doing that little question at the start to help people arrive and be like oh yes I'm here how am I like uh, you know like this we had the most random one uh, in our team that went down really well the other day which was if you're a punctuation what would you be 
<laughs> and it really makes people think and people were like I'm definitely like I'm brackets for sure because I've always got something extra to add as you can tell in this like I go off on tangents or add something extra um but my co-founder was a, uh, a period like mm-hmm. a stop yeah. because she drilled to the point and this and it really and it told us a bit about who we were and people could call it they were like you are that and it's such a tiny little small but mighty silly thing that helps us connect like connect and and brings a, a levity into what could otherwise be like a packed day yeah and it shows how we how we see ourselves how we would like to see also how we how we think mm-hmm. exactly exactly so what do you see in a yeah it's a beautiful question oh ah. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah one last question before we close what is the one thing that you would have liked to know before when you just got started with the chief makers Ooh, that's a really oh, with the, or facilitation work well i'm not sure if it's something that necessarily i would have liked to know back then but it is something that i would say to people now starting out or like either running a business or in facilitation is do it together mm. like i just love i feel so privileged to have such a wonderful uh, team and co-founder like I just I mean maybe I'm biased because I'm a facilitator and my whole role is to bring people together to collectively explore something but like your individual brain can only do what your individual brain can do bring other brains into that and there's that's where the best stuff lies so we at Mischief really have a stance of always Mm -hmm. um, co-facilitating someone else might see something that you don't it frees up like okay I'm with the group and I'm present and you're setting up you're putting on the playlist or you're writing something on the board or whatever it is so I accidentally started that way but I would definitely like say that that is such a testament to who I am as a facilitator or a business leader and I would really recommend like finding your co-facilitators even like the way that mischief is set up is that we work with freelance facilitators uh, across projects we have a facilitation pool and network and associates and we sometimes say it's like foster colleagues like <laughs> it can sometimes be a bit of a lone game if you are a facilitator out there then maybe you're on your own and I again I'm maybe biased because I work with organizations about their culture and ways of working but you want like we spend that amount of time working every day let's do it with people that we're building those relationships with let's share best practices like let's be able to go through challenges together let's be able to support one another yeah 100 percent. and it, thank you for sharing that i think it's so important also as facilitators we a and this full circle back to the beginning very few still understand what it means so having a peer group, a foster family, <laughs> digital family, a community. That was yeah. also one of the reasons why I started the Never Done Before community is to bring these people together so that to have someone who understands what you're doing, what you talk about. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a reason why we self-selected into this profession. Yeah. So there is this need of bringing people together and collaborating. And we do it so well for others. Mm. And I think there's also the desire of having this for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, the desire and the, we should, everyone should have it for themselves. It's a lovely thing to have. And it, yeah, talking of making work feel good. It's the people I think you spend your time with that make anything feel good. So, yeah. Totally. Wonderful. This conversation definitely made me feel good. (laughs) Me too. It was lovely. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure. Yeah. Is there any specific point where you would like to send the audience to and we'll put also everything in the show notes so that they can find you the mischief makers yes thank you so yeah of course there's more about what the work that we do on mischief makers on our website and there and our, on linkedin our insta and there's that mischief meeting moments that i mentioned that's go use it have fun with it people and then i would also say actually my team have just launched emilyhinks.com uh, yes because uh, i'm doing a lot more yeah i'm i'm speaking a lot more conferences and podcasts around human centered organization design but also the female founder journey and uh, neurodiverse leadership so yeah i would love to invite people to check that out and if there are 
events in the company or or uh, yeah talks in the company or events or else or other communities I would love to get the word out there more and more about facilitation as a fuel for good so I would yeah love if you could check that out and yeah see if I'm a match beautiful <laughs> thank you so much thanks Miriam it was such a pleasure yes thank you for staying tuned and for listening until the very end I hope that you found the inspiration and the wisdom that you are looking for. And I hope that you will subscribe to the show so that you never miss any of the interviews with another inspiring facilitator from across the world. I'm devoted to continue this podcast and to deliver weekly an episode that maintains the quality that you expect and you deserve. And if you would like to help me to maintain this quality and to keep the podcast free, please help us visit workshops.work slash support to make a small donation to keep the podcast free. Thank you so much. I hope to be in your ears next week. <laughs>